And this evening we have Jasmine, Jasmine Carter. Jasmine has traveled the world. She's lived in Asia um, with her family. Um, she's done horse riding. We've been talking about <laughs> horse riding this afternoon. <laughs> Among many, many other things in her life. And um, Jasmine's going to be sharing with us on the topic, making decisions under stress. Um, and what's interesting about this particular title is that it's not a, just about making decisions, me making decisions when I'm under stress, but making decisions when other people are under stress and I'm having to deal with their stress and making a decision. And what's even more interesting for me is um, making decisions when um, it has to be a collaborative decision. We've all come, got to agree on some outcome. Um, and whether or not I'm stressed, I'm aware of everybody else's stress and need. And so there are many levels of stress that we have to cope with in our lives. And um, Jasmine is the most undisturbed person I know in life. Nothing ruffles her. Um, I wouldn't even say she's like a duck on water where or a swan on water where she's absolutely serene on the top and about paddling like mad at the bottom under the water i i don't see jasmine as one of those people jasmine's a swan that allows the river to do the work for her or it seems to <laughs> do the work for her so she's a magic magician on that level um so over to you jasmine i'm going to um, log myself out so that we can focus on you and what you're going to share with us and I'll be back after the meditation to take the questions that come right. in. Thank you very much. Okay. So good evening everybody. It's so nice to be here and so wonderful to be able to drop into London so easily. <laughs> One advantage of um, Zoom and everything. So we're talking today about uh, decision making um, under stress. And um, it's been a very stressful year, hasn't it? Uh, we've started the year with Brexit and Trump. And then um, unexpectedly, COVID-19 came up into existence for us as a real challenge and uh, financial problems and so 2020 by June has is a very very stressful year and we don't know what is to come um, but having said that and in fact I do strongly believe that um, the atmosphere of negativity that is created by all the very stressful things uh, that have gone on so far this year and, and continuing to go on, um, do put a very negative energy into the atmosphere. And I think it affects us. I, I really do think that has an effect. It's in the vibration. And Regardless of that, and that has an impact, definitely that has an impact, um, I believe that the real stresses and strains that we experience particularly are ones that are related to our own situations and our own relationships. And I think we all realize that um, it's no good that we um, challenge other people uh, challenge the situations that we're in by not accepting them. Um, and of course, if I do uh, try to make other people change or try to not, or, or I don't accept the situation, um, then actually I'm just making the situation worse. And we experience that, don't we? And so really it's a matter of me taking responsibility for these difficult situations and for me to be proactive, uh, for me to go into solution mode, um, 
in fact, for me to be different, do something different. Um, so that I think is the real call um, for me you know, in these stressful times to really rise to the occasion, think outside the box, do something positive. Because otherwise, if I always do what I always done, I will always get <laughs> what I always got. And so I think that's really the, um, the, ch the main challenge at the moment. And um, I actually uh, would like to just tell you a story about a very good friend of mine. Um, this friend went to work in Hong Kong and um, he was his job was to be manager of a department in a professional firm and he was going to spend the first three days actually um, with the outgoing manager and so he met this manager called we'll call him Matt <laughs> and um, Matt had his own little office in this department and then there was open plan seating uh, for 30 um, members of his department and they were all women as it happened and um, they were either qualified, some well qualified, some um, taking their exams still but they were professional people and so anyway um, Matt says to Nick this ingoing manager um, what you do is you close your door in this little office and then when you want someone you just open the door and you shout at, you shout for them to come and in the evening when they bring the work that they've done and they get it and if it's if it's not right you just put a line through it and you go and tell and you tell them to go and um, get it right so Nick was with this chap for three days and then on the fourth day of course he was the manager so he goes in and he goes into his office and he leaves the door open and uh, when the staff members need to come in with their work to have it signed off uh, he would go he would say uh, bring up a chair and they would sit together and they would go through it and um, he would say if there was anything that wasn't he'd say this is very good you've done very well but there is this point that's not that um, I tell you what, what if you look in the book blah 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 um, you will actually find the right method uh, the accurate way to do it so he was teaching them as well you know how to what was right in these situations and so the person would go away and would be able to look for themselves at um, this and everybody was a bit um, untrusting they thought you know what is going on here because to start with they didn't know whether they were going to get a worse manager or um, the same sort of manager and so they couldn't quite make out what was going on anyway Nick worked for this company this profession this um, partnership for eight years and they all came to completely trust him they realized he was genuine uh, he was nice he was witty he was cheerful he was helpful and genuinely helpful and they actually gave him the nickname of superman and everybody enjoyed working there before with Matt there had been a huge amount of um, staff changes and um, with Nick it was very stable and um, the profits of the department rose and rose where it had been pretty questionable before with Matt and so really um, and it wasn't stressful you can imagine you know the stress levels when Matt was there were absolutely enormous but the stress levels with Nick there well, they didn't really exist you know it was a very happy department so anyway after eight years he gave his notice in and for the last month that he was in that job one of the department would take him and his family out for an evening and each one of them arranged something for the 30 days of the month each one of them and then on the last evening they hired a hall and they uh, arranged a banquet for Nick and his family um, it was just so wonderful to see and so stressless and 
So, you know, really my feeling from all this is a big heart is what's needed. If we have a big heart, then we will definitely find that stress levels reduce. So my first thought to offer you is that what we need in situations, what we need to do in life, I feel, is actually to develop a big heart. Really helpful. And that big heart reduces stress and it actually brings personal resilience because when we're happy, we do become a lot stronger and things are a lot easier to deal with. And also, you know, if you're what resilience is in um, situations is being the same before the situation, during the situation, and after the situation. And so, if you, you know, if you are big hearted and not stressed, you will find that you can maintain that. So, uh, your resilience is there because uh, inner strength is a real power to have. And it comes from um, doing the right thing and, um, you know, so yes, doing, doing the right thing and um, being happy with what you do. Uh, it makes a big difference because it brings that stability. Stability is that inner power. Um, I don't know, you probably heard of the Ubuntu tribe and the Ubuntu tribe actually is... Um, a tribe that Mandela was part of. Anyway, some anthropologists wanted to um, study uh, the Ubuntu tribe. Uh, and so they went and spent time with them. Anyway, one day, one of the anthropologists said that, um, puts a big basket of sweets under a tree. And he told the children to line up and to race to the tree. And whoever got there first um, could have the basket of sweets and so these children at the start of the race they all joined hands they held hands they ran together they got to the sweets and they shared them between them so that was the children just doing what was natural to them so I'm sure that was a hugely stressless environment <laughs> and a very happy place to be <laughs> But very beautiful. I really felt that was so lovely. Um, so the other thing I think is very important is, you know, there was a line in Harry Potter, in a Harry Potter book that really um, struck me as very important. And it said, don't do what's easy, do what is right. So that's that takes some diligence, doesn't it? It takes some perseverance to do that. But if I can do what's something that is right, rather than something that is just easy, then my self-respect increases hugely. And if I have more self-respect, then I'm more in touch with the good qualities inside me. I will like myself more. Because my feeling really is that we need to connect with the deepest truth within us, which is peace. And so I will be much more peaceful if I'm doing the right thing rather than the easy thing. That's when my conscience can be clear. And with a clear conscience, the fear goes and the stress goes. You know, so, um, you know, it's uh, to do the right thing is really puts us in such good stead. It really does. And um, the other thing is because we need that self-respect to like ourselves. And when I like myself, I'm actually more able naturally to like other people in a really nice way. And so um, what is also important for me is that I don't lose my dignity in situations because my self-esteem, my self-worth, my self-respect will be the ones that um, pay the price for that. And so if I keep my dignity in situations, then um, I will always find that the situation leaves me quite quickly 
Let me just give you an example of what I mean. If um, I'm going, I go out to take someone in the car to the station and the, somebody has parked across the drive and I can't get out. So I go up to the person and I explain that I've got to get to the station. Uh, there's a train to be caught. Would they move their car? And I meet resistance. And so I don't get cross. I don't raise my voice. I just keep asking if they could please move because I need to get out and take this person to the station. And eventually they move, which is fine. But if I went up to this person and I got cross and I was um, being, diff you know, sort of a whole attitude of being a lot more difficult about it, then the resistance would be even more. And then I might start to raise my voice, I might start to get cross, I might start to feel, oh gosh, they won't move and we'll miss the train. And then they get agitated. And so there's agitation, stress all the way through the conversation. And we say things to each other that um, are not nice. And eventually the other person might begrudgingly move and it might take a huge amount of time longer than the first option. And when I come back from the station, having behaved in the second way, I go inside and I say to you, oh, this happened and that happened and the other happened and this and that and the other. And I'm wearing myself out. I'm using so much energy and I'm going on about it and I'm thinking about it and I'm getting quite stressed by the whole thing and the other person's thinking about it. But if I go with the first option and I come back inside, I will hardly say anything to you because um, the situation's closed. You know, I didn't get cross. I didn't lose my dignity. And so I'm not bothered by it. And the other person will be a lot less bothered regardless of what they said. That might upset them. But the thing is that if I want to keep my dignity, um, then the behavior of the other person will not affect me anything like to the same extent. I will get over it far quicker. So if what happens when um, I do lose the plot is that um, I then blame you for provoking me. I won't, I won't take the blame myself. I will just um, really believe on some level <laughs> that you are the you are the provoker and it's all your fault and nothing to do with me you, you provoked me um, and so I don't even take responsibility for it so when we do um, lose the plot we do definitely suffer our uh, self-respect goes right down and it weakens us um, self-respect gives me strength and um, when, it, when I lose it, definitely I become weak. And so then my next action will not be so positive. It will be more negative. Um, so it is very important to come from the right intention, clean motives. Um, and it takes in the strength, it takes integrity. And uh, it is a matter of developing a good relationship with myself. Um, so I think one thing that I really need to do to help accomplish a stress-free life is I need to change the self-talk. <laughs> you know, we can be so hard on ourselves and really beat ourselves up. And if, you know, I really do understand that my um, deepest need is to connect to the truth of my inner peace, then if I'm always uh, berating myself for things and beating myself up, then I might be a peaceful being, but I can't access it. And so I won't really believe it's there. You know, oh, here I go again. You know, so I think it's terribly important for us actually to um, change that inner self-talk um, so that I become much more of a friend to myself much more able to accept myself as I am, that I've got lovely qualities, good qualities, and I have some weaknesses. And to really come from that space so that um, my self-talk um, is actually 
letting me get in touch with my own beauty because that really is the need and this actually is the beginning of meditation because in meditation um, it comes from the word uh, the latin word the latin verb to heal and when i um, start to meditate i'm getting in touch with my good qualities and um, it's actually the start of self-compassion as well as meditation because when we meditate in raja yoga meditation that's what we're doing we're um, accessing our beautiful qualities and we are thinking about them and, um, and so this actually heals that i am connecting with that beautiful part of myself that is true of each one of us each one of us have these beautiful qualities and virtues and so in meditation that's what we're doing we're accessing them and also we can access the um the divine energy that beauty of the of the source and so meditation is extremely helpful extremely helpful and um, it has made such a difference for me and <clears throat> Um, actually, someone was telling me the other day that in Germany, if you meditate, there are companies uh, that give you a lower um, cost uh, when you take out in life insurance with them. You don't have to pay quite so much if you're a meditator. <laughs> so that's also good. I mean, they must have um, investigated that and discovered that meditation really does help. <laughs> Um, and um, the other thing is, the, as much as possible, I need to keep to truth. Sometimes it's necessary to keep to, to uh, tell a white lie, and that's okay um, because sometimes it is for the greater good, and oh, but only <laughs> when it's for the greater good of the circumstances, the situation, the people. Um, Otherwise, um, the truth is what's needed. Because if I do tell a white lie in a good situation where it's so worthwhile, it actually will just increase self-respect. But uh, as much as, you know, otherwise, we really do need to keep to truth. Um, and one reason is that um, if I'm telling the truth, there's a lot less fear in any case. Um, and also, um, Truth always comes out. Truth cannot remain hidden. Uh, it's one of the laws of the universe. And actually, my sister works in a court of law. And uh, she says quite often um, elderly people are brought in uh, to be tried you know, for trial uh, because it's taken the police a long time to pin them down to the crime that they committed. But it happens eventually. So even in old age, they come in front of the court so yes it is a spiritual law in fact but truth cannot be hidden so much better for me to tell the truth unless it's appropriate to tell a white lie <laughs> yeah um also um affirmations help and um i we we have someone who comes here in normal circumstances and situation uh, to meditate with us regularly and she's not someone who had a very high self-esteem. And um, so anyway, she, was, she started to, to meditate here regularly and to say affirmations to herself. And also, she, she changed her handwriting. She had this book by Vimala somebody. And um, so she dismantled her handwriting. She said it looked an absolute mess for a while. <laughs> well, she <laughs> reassembled it according to Vimela's alphabet. And now um, she's got that going. She's fluent in it. She's, she can do it very nicely. Her handwriting's fine. And anyway, she says that now, and she keeps all this going. She keeps meditating, she keeps the affirmations going, and she's practicing her handwrite, new handwriting technique. And she says that it's really changed her attitude towards herself. 
She didn't have a high opinion of herself. And now she can stand there and say, I love myself and I love everybody else. And actually before she also didn't have a good relationship with her daughter. And now she and her daughter are good friends. Uh, they get on very well. And I'm not kidding you. <laughs> they really, they're good friends. So that was really nice, you know, so it's her positivity again uh, and making an effort, you know. I always remember actually um, going into uh, the cafe in our centre, there was a little eat dining room, I suppose you'd call it, the little dining room in our centre. And um, there was someone there who's a very, very good musician. And I heard him saying to someone that he practices the scales every day. I thought, well, you know, that's interesting that someone who is so good at, m at playing music, playing the piano, actually, that he still does the scales every day. So really, we need to hang on to those uh, building blocks, don't we, and practice them a lot, practice and practice. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention uh, was... Um, that we are all actually completionists. We might not realize it, but we are only really happy when we complete things so that there is a positive outcome. And this is very true of our thoughts. Um, if the outcome is positive and I stop thinking about it, then I've conserved my thoughts. And because there's been a positive outcome, I don't need to think about it anymore. But if there is something negative going on then it hasn't really finished and it will be taking my thoughts away I and mean, just to give you a quick example um, just say that um, I've been out shopping I come home and I am told that somebody phoned me and um, would I ring them back so um, I actually then find that I have something else to do. So I do that and oh, then I have lunch and then I wash up and the time's going on. I keep thinking, oh my goodness, I haven't phoned so-and-so back. And I keep thinking about it. It keeps coming onto my mind and um, I don't get round to it. The longer I leave it, the more I find that there are other things I have to do and I don't ring her back. And so by the evening, my enthusiasm for speaking to her is way down, nothing personal but just my energy levels have gone down so far. And um, when I pick the phone up, it just feels like a lump of lead. And the phone conversation isn't as fluent, isn't as easy, isn't as you know, joyful as it would have been. But if I had come in the door and been told so-and-so rang, oh, good, great, and I rang them back straight away, we'd have had a nice conversation um, and then rung off eventually I would have done it I didn't wouldn't even then think about it again and I go on with the rest of my day so this is what we do to ourselves it's, it I think it's very important actually to complete things as quickly as possible um, so they don't hang on hang around because it will take my energy and my energy uh, is coming a lot of it I mean thoughts are energy in actual fact and so if I'm draining my energy because I keep coming back to thinking, oh my goodness I still haven't done it I'm going into negativity I'm going into waste thoughts <clears throat> excuse me sorry and I'm draining my my energy levels through um, letting these thoughts go on and on and on and they're not positive and that's the problem it's non-positive thoughts that drain me so that's just something I wanted to mention to be aware of um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was that um, one thing that causes a lot of stress is when we try to control things. Um, and what is often, what is usually happening when we're trying to control things is that we're going into the past. We remember how, say, I'm going back into the past in a situation because I remember how you behaved last time this situation came up. And so I'm quite convinced that you're going to do it again. And so I don't give you the opportunity. I take control and um, sort this out in my, the way I want it to be. Um, and then that, of course, is going to lead to not good repercussions and so 
by me trying to control things, by me not letting go of the past, not letting you come new to the situation as if there'd been no history. I provoke you actually into, because we're creatures of habit, of doing exactly what you did last time because I've set it up that you're going to then do the same again. So uh, just to take a scenario, just to, just to explain what I mean by this, is um, just say a couple, um, we're taking a couple as an example. So the wife, the phone rings, the partner, the, one, of the, one of the pair, pick up the phone and um, it's a friend on the other end saying, oh, why don't the two of you uh, meet up with us next week? And say it's the woman who's picked up the phone. So she knows that her partner from past experience is not very sociable and quite often doesn't want to go out. And when he does eventually go out, he wants to know what time they're com we're coming back. What time can we leave to come home again? So all this is going through her mind. And so she rem she's remembering what happens, what happened before. And so she says, oh, yes, love to come. That would be really nice. And she thinks, right, I'll face my partner afterwards. So she rings off. And now she's got to go and say to him, say, that um, she's taken this phone call and they were invited to go round to these friends next week. And so... I've said yes. And he says, but why didn't you say, I'll speak to, call him Jim, <laughs> I'll speak to Jim, see what he says and uh, see, and have a, not, not see what he says, sorry. I'll speak to Jim. We can look in our diaries and um, I'll ring you back. And so, in fact, that's exactly what she should have done. <laughs> and so if we actually behave well, behave properly what I'm doing is I'm not going just to sort of break that one down again to go back on what I said to start with if I um, go back if I come to you fresh as if we have no history between us you have never done anything wrong to me you know this is what the aim is just to come fresh to the situation like a new story and then the phone rings and so I say to this friend oh thank you that's a lovely invitation I will um, ask Jim and we'll, and we'll need to look at our diaries and I'll ring you back um, so I'm not controlling the situation I'm not in any way remembering that you're not very sociable and you probably say no I've just stopped thinking that and giving you the chance in the present moment to have changed. You know, if I hold you in the past, you're never going to change with my thoughts, you know, with that energy. So if I just come into the present and allow you to change, and I say to you then, um, oh, Jim, uh, should we look in our diaries uh, for next Tuesday? Because so-and-so has invited us to go around. What, what do you think? And what are, you, what are your plans? And let's see. And so because I've done the right thing, I won't actually mind whether he says yes or no, because that deep connection of ourselves with our true inner peace is far more important. And so that is an important relationship to me. And so I don't mind now. I can, because I have done the right thing in the present moment, I will be able to totally let go of the outcome. And it's just fine if he says, I don't want to go and we have to ring, I have to ring back and, or he can ring back, come to that. Why do I have to do it if one of us can ring back and just explain that we can't go around? And if we go, we go, that's great. But if he, if he says no and we don't go, because my absolute firm belief is that everybody is intrinsically good, but there will come a day, if I behave correctly, when he will say, look, I don't really want to go, but I know you do. And so let's go. We'll go. You know, that's very likely to be the outcome. If I surrender to the good, 
and actually keep my conscience clear. I have good intentions. I have good motives because that's what I that's where I need to come from. Good motives, clear, good intentions and a clear mind or a clear conscience. And I won't have fear. I won't have stress. Life becomes a lot sweeter. Um, so the other thing I wanted to tell you about was that um, many years ago, a doctor from a hospital that we built in India, uh, it's right next to our headquarters in Mount Abu Rajasthan. And we built this hospital, gosh, I should think about 93. And uh, it's got a large number of BKs uh, working as doctors there, and it's got a large number of non-BKs working there. And um, one of the BKs, one of the Brahma Kumaris, who's a psychiatrist, um, came to England and visited Worthing here, where I am in the centre, in 2007. And he gave a talk for us. And in the talk, he said, I'm a volunteer. I don't get a salary. I don't want a salary. I'm very happy with things the way they are. But I don't have any need to keep you in that chair. There are psychiatrists who will need to keep you in that chair because you'll pay them large sums of money. Not all, obviously, but there will be some. I don't need to. So he said, I'm going to tell you how to reduce your stress in a way that will keep you so sane that you will not go into the psychiatrist's chair there'll be no need and so I wondered if you'd like me to share these points with you and as you can imagine they are a little bit demanding otherwise um, you know if we were all so strong we'd be so sane we'd be so stressless that um, we wouldn't need to be reminded, but it's, it, they are reminders of how to go back to our um, self-respect. Really, you know, by practicing these, your self-respect will really rise. So the first one, do everything that you need to do, that is all tasks and roles, with utmost sincerity and honesty, roles must be carried out to a high standard and we should be able to change roles as and when needed. If we are not flexible, we will have conflict and internal stress. So that's a good thing to remember that I have to do everything to the best of my ability but also, if somebody comes along who needs me to give them attention and I have to stop what I'm doing, I need to have that flexibility that I can stop and go and help them with what they need and then come back to my job. Um, two, I'm saying them a little bit quickly because I'm aware of time because probably people will want to ask questions and things. Um, so, to number two, and we can go through anything here in the question if anybody wants to know more. So, two, develop and maintain good relationships with everyone that you meet. Do this regardless of their behaviour, so it comes back to that inner dignity, doesn't it? So develop and maintain good relationships with everyone that you meet. Do this regardless of their behavior. Three, maintain the same mood of cheerfulness throughout the day. Easy to say, but can be difficult to do. Avoid major ups and downs. So we've been looking at that, haven't we? About how to avoid major ups and downs. If I feel irritable, rectify it at that moment. Lift your own mood naturally. Maybe go and meditate. Go for a walk. Four. A good diet and a good balance of sleep, diet, rest and exercise. Too much 
or too little of any of these can cause stress. This includes fasting, over-exercising, too little sleep. Now, you know, the other day I just happened to put the radio on and it's, there were two scientists speaking who, who both specialised in sleep and um, they both agreed on one thing. I mean, they agreed on other things as well, but the one thing that they particularly agreed on was that nobody should have less than four hours sleep a night. That would be sleep deprivation. And really, he was, they were both absolutely clear not to have more than seven hours. You know, we all used to believe eight hours, but they both totally agreed seven hours is the ideal amount to go for you and not eight. Um, and this fasting, you know, now we do, we do have intermittent fasting. And, I, and you know, I th my understanding from this is that two meals a day are absolutely fine. To miss the third meal is not fasting. So just to make that point, just to mention that. Um, he said that if we do fast, over-exercise or have too little sleep, it causes depression, anxiety and stress. If you have been working hard, extra sleep at the weekend can rejuvenate you. Sleep is according to age and activity. Number five, make time for hobbies, etc. This acts as an antidepressant. If we do not have opportunities for pleasurable activities, we are acting like machines. Read, play music, meditate, etc. Because our minds want to learn, don't they? And also, it's an antidepressant to be creative, isn't it? Number six. Now, <laughs> this is an interesting one. Too much or too little money causes stress. We should aim to have sufficient. In developed countries, 80% of what people buy, they do not use. It is piled up. Research shows that happiness in developed countries is lowest. So research shows that happiness in developed countries, developed countries is lowest. And underdeveloped countries is low. Money is an asset if earned according to needs. Um, and so, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so actually we have a retired vicar's home here in Worthing. They're absolutely delightful people. We know quite a few of them. They come to our talks and they've done courses here. Anyway, I met one on the seafront and um, he said to me, I, I've, I've got too much money. I'm really getting stressed by it. I thought, wow, how interesting that he's realised that too much money is stressful. And um, so he said, I've got to find a charity. I've got to find a charity and donate to it. So I didn't like to mention that we were a charity. He didn't donate it to us. Maybe he's never gave it to anybody. I don't know. But anyway, I thought that was pretty observant of him to realize that too much money was a stress. And number seven, which is the last one, gadgets and high technology are stressful. As a new version of the gadget comes onto the market very quickly and we have to learn how to use it all over again. So that actually is quite stressful. <laughs> so that was the main things I wanted to mention to you. And so I really do believe, you know, that um, our deepest truth um, the deepest point of each one of us is peace and it's our deepest need to connect ourselves to that peace. We need to be true to ourselves, connect with the source and a great deal of power will be experienced. 
Um, now, I wonder whether uh, it's the time to take questions or whether... Could we have the meditation? Sure, sure. Thanks for the reminder. Thanks for reminding me, Archie. Yes, sure. Okay, let's meditate now then. I sit quietly, gently becoming aware of my breathing and the natural flow of my breath. It makes me quiet inside and I relax. Each muscle in my body feels it has permission to relax, to expand and take its natural form in the body. The body is at rest. The heart is at rest. I am at rest. I, the self, the inner being, sit in the gentle light. And I gently turn my attention to the light within. My attention is focused on the being. The quiet one on the inside. The one who is always still, even though the mind can feel it is running in many directions. I wish to match the moving thoughts of the overactive mind with the still part of I, the soul, and experience peace. valuable space. I take a few deep breaths. And then I focus on something still and quiet. I choose to think of a beautiful lake and focus on its stillness, its beauty, its depth, its clarity. its freshness and the beautiful still scenery that surrounds it. The beautiful warm yellow sunshine is reflecting into it. I step back from the scene and discover that my mind stopped racing and is still and synchronized with the lake. I feel calm. I feel clear, stable and refreshed. As my thoughts slow down, as my mind slows down, 
I become more balanced, more positive, and truth starts to blossom. Now, whatever I want to do, I can do properly and well. I can get things done without rushing. I am organized and greatly respect time, effort and energy. Balance. I care for my own well-being. I care for my long-term sanity by being content to be here and now and be present with myself and not missing the silver linings and beauty of scenes that come in front of me and in which I am standing. Om Shanti. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, um, are you okay to take questions? Sure. All right. The first one is, um, this is, this is <coughs> such a beautiful talk. Your energy, your time, everything is so soothing. I'm, this, I'm in a challenging time when racial tensions are under strain. Can you provide any advice and guidance for moving towards peace, inclusion, togetherness and acceptance? Right. Um, well, first of all, good wishes are incredibly powerful. And so if I can do something to help the situation, then let me do it. If there isn't anything I personally can do in this situation, let me send good wishes out. It makes a huge difference. And can I suggest, and this might seem really strange, that you send good wishes to the perpetrator as well as to the victims. Because as we've been looking at in this talk, actually, it's only with a big heart that things can calm down. And we can only, people will only change through love. Love is the greatest transformer. Harshness does not change us. Our prisons don't work. You know, we won't, you know, people need love, however badly they have behaved. And this is the transformer. So although this might seem rather unusual, my suggestion is if you aren't able to do anything personally yourself, would be to stand back from the situation as a detached observer. See a bigger picture, that's always helpful, and um, send good wishes. I hope that helps. Thank you. The second question is, it seems all well behaving this way, it seems all well behaving this way, but what about people who have a manipulative mind and take us for granted? For being so peaceful. Is this not being a doormat? Most people cannot change unless there is a strong firm response. Can you clarify? Well my feeling is <clears throat> if I am just being a doormat then frankly I am going to get walked over. But just because I'm peaceful does not mean that I can't express my opinion, I can't say my peace, it's just that I won't get emotional. I will be able to tell you politely, um, where I stand in this, how I see it, what truth is for me. And um, so if I keep to my integrity, uh, that is actually where my peace is. And as long as I behave correctly, to be honest, the other person's opinion is of less importance. It is very important about my opinion of myself. It looks 
<laughs> as if it's important about what the other person's saying. But the reality is, it's all about my relationship with myself. And so if I am behaving in a way uh, that I can have self-respect, then I won't have to be so bothered about how the other person is behaving it, and it won't impact on me, you know, a bit like the example earlier. So it won't impact on me to any great extent if I know I'm behaving correctly. In fact, it makes me stronger. Lovely. Um, next question. When I'm stressed, I feel immobilized and sit on the sofa for hours. Can you give me any advice? What my suggestion would be is that I have a daily practice of meditation um, and maybe affirmations, a bit like the person I was mentioning to you. Um, I, we can't uh, just, you know, say the, um, the taxi driver or someone is shouting at me, I can't sit down for five minutes and meditate, say to him, uh, look, just give me five minutes while I meditate and then I'll answer you and then come back with a cool, calm answer. You know, we have to practice meditation in advance because um, I need to get back in touch with the truth of myself, connect with that truth of myself and the source and the truth of myself is uh, that I'm a being of peace and I need to be true to that. Um, so we, that's one reason why meditation is so important uh, in my book. <laughs> uh, it's what's helped me so much is uh, to meditate regularly. It's a bit like that chap I was telling you who plays the piano, who does the scales every day. He doesn't believe for a minute he would be such a good pianist if he didn't practice the scales every day. So that would be my suggestion. And you'll probably find you have a lot more energy. <clears throat> because meditation is always positive. We always talk positively to ourselves when we meditate. So <coughs> it's just a slight dry throat from speaking. Sorry about that. Okay, next question. I'm confused with it's okay to tell white lies. Surely lies are lies and white lies can be subjected. Um, so... I don't agree with any form of lies. Surely honesty spoken with skill and kindness is better. I'll give you an example, actually, because I saw it um, just before lockdown happened. And that is that we, ha we have workmen. We had workmen here at that time. And the boss of the company um, had put a ladder up outside and his, um, in, his worker, um, was with him and they were doing the work together but for some reason um, the ladder hadn't been put up correctly and the worker um, fell off the ladder he didn't hurt himself that badly but he did go to a &E just to have it checked out and uh, he had sprained his ankle so it was all wrapped up and then the doctor said to him uh, where did you do this? And so quick as a flash, this chap says at home. Now that wasn't true. He told a white lie, but it was for the good of the situation to protect his boss because his boss just made a, an error. He didn't mean to do it. It just happened. A flash of a moment. So it just saved an awful lot of what could have been, you know, sort of more tricky um, by just telling a white lie. I hope that helps to explain what I'm really getting to. Thank you. Um, there's a few more. Are you okay for time? Yeah, I am. Okay, so the next question, sorry, is um, how not to fall into the trap um, of doing what we love as our income? How do you find a balance in your hobby if your hobby is your work? Oh, well, I think that's great. But the thing I have to guard against, if my hobby is my work, one thing I need to guard against is becoming a workaholic. Uh, it is a real danger, actually. And <clears throat> you'll know you'll become a workaholic if the only time you're happy is when you're working and um, you have a long face when you're not working. I'm just telling you as a fact, that's what happens. And um, so 
I remember one person, she was a workaholic. She absolutely loved her job, you know, and uh, she had to go into hospital. No one came to visit her because she was just so focused on her work. She had no time for friends. And at that moment, she had this wake up call. Oh, my goodness, I've overdone it. So what she then started to do was whenever there was a need that she could spot where somebody needed help, she would go and help them. And this made all the difference to her life. She then came into balance and uh, she'd make, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, she'd make cakes for people, all sorts of things, you know. And um, so she then became a rounded person. So I'm sure you haven't gone that far, but just to tell you what can happen, what is possible to happen down the line if the job is also um, my hobby. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for your beautiful talk. My question is how to work on finding the clarity inside of yourself when choosing between A or B, one thing or another, as I often struggle to make decisions, as I'm undecided, and concentrate on what I lose making a uh, on what I lose when making a choice. If I choose A, I also feel sad about losing option B, for example. How to find the strength inside and when making decisions and leave the fear apart. Right. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I thought to tell you just now, it's just vanished. Hang on. I'm thinking. something I was going to tell you. I can't think what it was. Um, oh. Would you mind if I come back to that one? Because I had a thought in my mind. And it slipped and away. And it just slipped away. I don't know where it went to. No problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem. Could you repeat number three? Number Should three. Number yeah. Three? Maintain the same mood of cheerfulness throughout the day. Easy to say, but can be difficult to do. Avoid major ups and downs. If I feel irritable, rectify it at that moment. Lift your own mood naturally. <clears throat> um, I've re remembered what I was going to say. <laughs> um, the question was for everybody, um, how to make decisions with clarity without feeling a loss so right well first of all a decision is not black and white um we can't really not i don't think deeply successfully <clears throat> make a list of pros and cons i don't think decisions work that way um i think it comes from a feel for it, a feel for who I'm dealing with, a feel from the situation I'm in. You know, it's richer, it's got more to it than just pros and cons. Um, and so it's being accurate and appropriate as well when I come to make a decision. And you know, um, this line in the Harry Potter book, which said, don't do what's easy, do what's right. I think that is a very important part. Um, that I'm, I don't have to be right in the decision I make. I have to be right. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I have to be right. So um, it's a matter of um, practicing um, the sort of things I've been telling, I've been talking about, because if we do um, <clears throat> adopt this method of doing things straight away and having fewer thoughts, I will have more energy to make proper, and that will go towards making decisions. Um, if I um, go into solution mode, that also helps. And one thing I would like to suggest is sometimes when things are on our mind, it's very difficult to see the wood for the trees. And so, you know, I do remember years ago when I first came to this house, um, we had no sound system and we had a public talk in a venue that had no sound system. And so someone offered to buy it for us. 
and um, the date was getting closer and closer and they weren't coming up with it they weren't ordering it or paying for it or anything and I got to the stage I couldn't decide what to do about it I felt a bit helpless and um, it was disturbing my meditation to be honest and so anyway suddenly one day I just came out of my meditation and for some reason I felt so positive and the solution just came to me so sometimes when we take a space when we pause particularly when it's been on our mind you take that pause and the right answer will come to you and what the answer came to me that day was stop being so dependent on someone else just go and buy it yourself <laughs> and I tell you I stopped thinking about it completely then I just felt this is right this is it this is what I shall do and so I intended to go and buy it it wasn't that expensive it wasn't a top of the range thing and you know because we're all interconnected it wasn't many hours before this person rang me up and said look we've got to get this sound system sorted out I'm ordering it today it'll arrive very soon you know this is what happens if I stand back and take a pause then the right solution comes in so it's very valuable and actually my father was an inventor and he used to take pen and paper to uh, his room with him so that when he woke up in the morning when he'd had that space of not thinking he often came up with a good idea and he would write it down so i think the value of a pause and coming into a positive state of mind is very helpful you mentioned affirmations. So what sort of affirmations should we use? And can you give us an example? Well, one thing I think is quite helpful is whatever I feel about myself that is negative, to actually think of the opposite. You know, if I think um, I'm irritable, then I am calm. It has to be in the first person, it has to be in the present tense, it has to be positive. So I must keep to those three things. So because we're under an illusion when we think that we lack patience or something, I haven't got any patience, maybe you could just, we could just say to ourselves, I am patient. And take, I would suggest to do it that way, whatever you think you're not, use that affirmation until you reconnect uh, with the truth that you are you do have this quality and you'll get a great deal of power from this experience i, I think okay um thank you um so someone's saying thank you very much uh, it was a very good talk i'm going through a very difficult time part-time caring for my mother who has dementia, which can make me upset but quite, and quite stressed. I have been doing a lot of meditation, often twice a day, but wonder if you can offer any other thoughts on how to maintain more of a balanced state of mind in light of this difficulty. You're going through a very difficult time. No two ways about it. I think really quite often we need a lot of patience with ourselves you know you're, you've got a lot of stresses and strains on you particularly when it's your mother uh, it can be possible to get a bit irritable or impatient with an elderly person who perhaps has dementia so for my peace of mind I would um, make every effort to actually use that virtue of patience to really consciously use patience and it becomes so beautiful so my suggestion as a start i hope it's of help to be very patient with yourself to get as much rest you know to follow what that psychiatrist said about the balance of food and sleep and rest it might be very difficult for you to get that actually but when you can because you can make up sleep um, at other times when you have a bit of free time um, and to be very patient with your mother 
uh, and give her a lot of love, a lot of love. You'll never regret it. Thanks. Thank you. And um, thank you, Jasmine, for making the time and spending extra time with us just to explore those questions. It's really appreciated. I'm going to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you all very much.